As the 2021 Formula One season draws towards its conclusion, there's been a lot of talk about power units and in particular the internal combustion engine. So I thought we'd take a look at the heart of the power unit, which is that V6 combustion engine. But not just that, being a bit more specific, I thought we'd take a look at the very heart of the combustion engine itself, the piston and the conrod. And I'm joined here by Craig Scarborough. Craig, We've got a piston and conrod in front of us. This is from a Formula One engine. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. So what we've got here is a piston and conrod, very kindly lent to us. It's from a Cosworth engine. So this is going back to the V10, V8 days. And what you'll notice about this is you have the piston and the conrod. And if anyone that's looked at road cars, motorbikes, two-stroke engines, the thing you'll notice is the size. The piston is enormous in diameter, but very shallow in depth and equally the comrade is incredibly short as well these are both very light we're going to talk a lot more about this as well but really unusual actually get your hands on something which looks as exquisite as this does now one of the reasons we have to use an older piston and conrod assembly is that basically this is the holiest of holies of formula one power units they won't let us see or look at the latest technology but greg talk us through some of the main parts of this because looking at this this little assembly here this is going to be taking some huge loads, isn't it? Yeah, so if you think back to the, the V8, V10 area, you had 20,000 RPM, which like actually went a little bit higher at one stage, but regulations kind of drew that back in. So enormous forces, even more so now with the cylinder pressures with the turbocharged engines. Less RPM, but the higher cylinder pressures. So what you have is uh, the piston. Um, now, regulations have changed over the years, but typically they're made from aluminium or steel. Um, this one, I believe, is an, is an aluminium one. And the design of the piston is quite interesting. It's what you call a slipper piston. So what you have is very shallow piston, very short skirt to reduce friction, which obviously is the, the killer in terms of power. You have your piston rings just like you would have on a typical road car, but with just one oil ring, one compression ring. And then on the top, you can see that there's very small cutouts for the valves. If you think there's the valve movement inside the top of the engine is, is quite high, you've got a big depth to the cams, but obviously you don't want to upset the shape of your combustion chamber. So it's relatively flat here. And the other key thing is these are subject to not just high pressures and speeds, but also temperatures. So they need to be cooled. So at the back, you have what's known as a box bridge design. So you have your gudgeon pin. Wrist pin if you're in America. Wrist pin in America. Very short, again, saving weight, which is critical. But what you then have is what's known as the box bridge design. Because it's so shallow, you need to have some strength to the piston. So you have these webs running across here to create what you call the bridge design. But equally with the pressures, you also have the temperatures that the piston's subject to. So while this is going up and down inside the piston like this you have oil sprays directed at each of these pockets to keep the piston cool from behind so that the combustion area doesn't have any hot spots now this is an older piston and i think it's worth talking about the differences between this piston and those that we're seeing in the 2021 v6 engines and i think you know how to explain that really clearly yeah so i have in a classic tv style made something a little earlier so this is the dimensions of the old three liter or 2.4 liter uh, engines and this is a 98.8 millimeter piston was the maximum you can have this one's a touch smaller nowadays you must have an 80 millimeter piston you don't have any options in changing the uh, stroke so this is the difference in size. You can see that the piston now is substantially smaller and you get a much smaller combustion engine, which is why we only got a 1.6 litre V6 and not something uh, slightly different in terms of uh, capacity and the number of pistons. So you can see that has been reduced. Now, one of the things that really fascinates me about the piston train in any engine, but particularly modern Formula One engines, is this, the connecting rod. Now, these parts here are subject to absolutely enormous forces. Now, this part is pretty solid. I mean, there's no way you could bend it or move it with your hand. It's just a big old lump of metal, very finely engineered metal. But in the old, the old engines like this TJ engine from Cosworth that it was in, these conrods would extend and compress by 0.6 of a millimeter every time it went up and down in that engine at full speed. And if you try and visualize how much movement that is and how difficult that is. Well, at 20,000 RPM or even at the maximum RPM, the modern F1 engines hit about 12,500, 13,000 over a curb perhaps. 
if you looked at that moving, you couldn't really see the movement. It's just a blur of movement, and that's how much force is going on. The piston at the end, at peak revs at 20,000 RPM, was weighing about two and a half tonnes, and this thing is holding it all together. So that's when you used to see those catastrophic engine failures and maybe the piston coming out the side of the engine. It's when one of these, the rod, has failed. I believe this rod is one of those that's been made in Austria, just near the, uh, the race circuit there, at a place called Kapfenberg. There's a company called Pankel that make most of the rods for most of the teams, but not all of them. But it's a very competitive area. Now, something I wanted to talk about with this component, it's very light in my hands, and indeed this one is actually slightly lighter than the current generations. A few years ago, uh, Formula One was really pushing the technology on the pistons and the conrods in particular, and the FIA wanted to control the costs of the sport and limited the weight of the connecting rod to 300 grams. It also limited the weight of the piston, including that wrist pin, also to 300 grams, but these parts from the old engines are a little bit lighter, aren't They're they? They're a bit lighter. We won't disclose the exact weights, although I have measured them. <laughs> and yeah, as you say, you've got to reduce weight with these high RPMs. Um, the loads on these are enormous, so everything matters. But that equally nowadays, because you can't spend all your money developing ever lighter and lighter, it does open up some opportunities to play with the materials. So currently, the piston, for example, you can only use aluminium or what uh, the regulations describe as an iron-based alloy, which in normal language is steel. I don't think they would use cast iron with something like this. And lots of rumours have circulated over the years about the materials and the way that teams have been playing about with pistons. I think there is a conventional as this. I don't think there's anything particularly clever going on in terms of uh, steel materials and different manufacturing techniques. Equally with the rod, you are really limited to titanium or again, an iron-based alloy, which is steel. And again, I think most of them will conform to that. And if you compared these throughout the current four manufacturers in Formula One, I don't think you would see a substantial difference in the, in the main design of what we're seeing here. Now, one area, and we talked about some of the secrecy around the materials, another area where you see really great secrecy is here, the piston crown. This is super important because this is the base of the combustion chamber. Now, when Formula One had open development or development tokens through the season for power units, a lot of teams would put a lot of work in on the combustion chamber, and what that gives is really good, efficient combustion. So a few years ago, the compression ratios in Formula One reached such a high level that it stopped almost being a pe conventional petrol engine. It was almost like a diesel engine. And the compression ratios and the pressures got so high that you didn't need the spark to ignite the fuel and air mixture. And it was almost a gasoline compression ignition engine, or what I like to call a semi-diesel, almost, almost mm -hmm. diesel engines in Formula One. The efficiency went through the roof, but so did the complexity and the cost. And lots of special brew fuels had to be used to make that work. So again, Formula One put a little bit of a restriction on the FI put a little bit of a restriction on what was allowed to be done. They limited the compression ratio to just 18 to 1, which is still incredibly high compared to what's in your road car, probably about 7 to 1 usually. But 18 to 1 is really high compression. Not quite in the realms of, you know, sparkless ignition but not far off it. And as the new rules and new fuels are introduced, you'll see the teams again and the engine manufacturers putting a huge amount of work in into the piston crown and developing that combustion chamber. But Craig, that's not all they did, is it, to get that extra efficiency? No, again, when you go back to sort of 2014 when the regulations changed with these high efficiency engines, remember over the winter there was a 30% reduction in the fuel available to burn inside the combustion chamber and we were looking for solutions like these um, compression ignition. The regulations, actually you almost miss it when you read it, it says it must be a spark ignition engine. So you couldn't really use some of these compression ignition techniques. So instead they moved to what's known as pre-chamber. Um, Mercedes were very first on the grid with this technology and is one of the things that really allowed them to take that leap back in 2014. Since then, every other manufacturer has used a form of this. So when you would think normally that this is inside the cylinder and the piston and you have the combustion chamber, the spark plug above, normally you would have a rich fuel mixture inside here that the spark plug would ignite and you get your ignition stroke. But when you have this limited amount of fuel that we've had since 2014, you don't have enough fuel in there to get full combustion. And this creates all sorts of problems inside the engine. So what they found is you actually create a secondary combustion chamber, typically on the end of the spark plug. Mm 
and that will have a rich fuel mixture inside as well as the spark plug electrodes and ignition starts inside this pre-chamber and what then happens is holes in this pre-chamber send jets of flame out below into this weaker mixture that sits above the piston inside the main combustion chamber and these jets fully ignite all of that fuel very rapidly giving you your combustion stroke and suddenly you've got this really efficient combustion system which strangely again comes from trucks so you were talking about compression ignition even if we think back to the the turbo era this was all truck technology that formula one has brought in and made sexy and high performance so pre-chamber is there and that is the real difference that's been made to make these engines just so efficient as they are now it's actually essentially more bang for your buck mm -hmm. but even though it is technology that's come over from the diesel world it is super efficient this is why these are the most efficient combustion engine engines ever seen in any racing formula anyway however these parts under the current regulations in 2021 are restricted the teams cannot develop the piston they cannot develop the conrod what they introduced at the start of the season is in theory what they should finish the season with with absolutely no changes whatsoever but is that really the case well yes and no <laughs> it's the classic answer they were allowed to make uh, an upgrade through the year but equally if they were having reliability problems they are allowed to change the components now there is a process for doing this this isn't just a carte blanche to go oh yeah it broke what they have to do is present all their evidence to the FIA. It gets distributed to the rest of the engine manufacturers. So you've got to be a little bit careful. You don't give away secrets during this. But yeah, the teams are allowed to make changes for reliability, cost saving and safety, which isn't for the engine such a factor. But they are allowed to make changes. So yeah, these are the areas, particularly with the piston crown and the inside of the combustion chamber and the top of the cylinder head that teams will want to play with because that's where you really get your performance. So in some respects, unreliability in these areas can lead to a performance update, which would be quite handy because you do it on the basis of reliability. And that's perhaps why, and not necessarily just on these components, that's perhaps why some of the teams and some of the manufacturers that have changed parts of their power unit, particularly the combustion engines, towards the end of the seasons may have seen a little bit of a performance boost. But then it could be something just as simple as new power unit, new combustion engine, you can push it a bit harder and get much bigger results. But the absolute core of the engine, I think, is a beautiful piece of engineering and will be core to Formula One for many years to come.